So I want to talk about um, the counteroffensive and how the counteroffensive is actually going and what the obstacles are and kind of the, the downside of what's going on. Um, I know that this is strange in between the Kirch being attacked and talking about how many Russian commanders have been taken off the battlefield recently because those sound like good news, good events. Um, but what I don't want to do is just engage in happy talk. So this is some bad news for framing and understanding what's going on. I don't want to be a propagandist. A propagandist is someone who provides information, especially of a biased or misleading nature used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. Now I'm all in on Ukraine, but if I don't give you the bad news as well, then I'm not really doing you the service you think I'm doing. So we're going to start here with RT. Now, not because RT is true. We're going to compare RT to the New York Times. After all, RT is saying that it's drawing on the New York Times for this article. So let's look at this RT article first. Uh, 20% of Ukraine, and this came out just at the end of the last week. I'm sorry I got interrupted by what happened with the Kerch, but this was going to be my very next video before the Kerch Bridge was hit, so I had to shift gears. Okay, 20% of Ukrainian weapons destroyed in just two weeks, says the New York Times. Now, that article would lead you to believe that 20% of all Ukrainian weapons are destroyed, but that's not exactly what happened. When you get into the article, let's say it says this, Kiev's Western Supply tanks and armored vehicles all burned. Again, that leads you to believe all are burned, but it's kind of shaping what's being said. It's not really lying, but it is kind of deceiving. So here, I'll show you what I mean. The Ukrainian military lost 20% of the equipment it sent to the battlefield during the first two weeks of the counteroffensive. That's not all of it, but that is 20%, and that's a legitimate number, and that's verified by the New York Times. The counteroffensive was slow and bloody and didn't get through like it was supposed to, and we're going to talk about why in just a little bit. Now, it also adds something that was not in the New York Times. Advancing through minefields and without air support, the Ukrainian military lost 26,000 men and more than 3,000 pieces of military hardware, according to the latest figures, from the R R Russian Ministry of Defense. So this wasn't in the New York Times, loss of 26,000 men. But again, it's saying that it's coming from the New York Times, so it's looking a little bit... Mm, deceptive at this point. It's just adding that to it. Ukraine's 47th Mechanized Brigade, by the way, this 26,000 figure seems very high to me. Um, and what, they, what the Russians generally do is talk about a 10 to 1, like they lost this, but we lost only a tenth of what they lost. And so if you just engage in some discounting, you can get to a truer number pretty quickly. Ukraine's 47th Mechanized Brigade, a NATO-trained unit, apparently lost 30% of its Bradley Fighting Infantry vehicles in two weeks, and the 33rd Mechanized Brigade lost nearly a third of its 32 German Leopard tanks in a single week. Now, when we go to the New York Times, we're going to find that there's something very true about those numbers. But why? They all burned. Now, they all burned was... Uh, Kiev's Western Supply of Tanks and Armored Vehicles all burned. Not all of them, but this 30% of these burned, said one Ukrainian soldier who witnessed at least six Western vehicles destroyed. According to Russian President Vladimir Putin, Russian forces have destroyed a total of 300 and, uh, 311 tanks since June 4th. At least a third of them, I believe, were Western-made tanks, including Leopards. Putin told Russia's 24 TV on Thursday. After the first two weeks, Ukrainian commanders decided to pause. Now, that is a true fact that after two weeks, they changed their tactics. With little territorial gain to show for Kyiv's losses, Western officials have expressed disappointment. Meanwhile, Ukraine's Western backers are running low on ammunition, particularly 155 artillery shells. So it's painting a very, very bleak picture and it's trying to make it even bleaker with this extra little bit about 26,000 men that I don't know where they pulled that figure from. So here's the actual New York Times article. We're going to go through this. Early in the counteroffensive, Ukraine lost as much as 20% of its weapons and armor. That's that which came to the front. In the first two weeks of Ukraine's grueling counteroffensive, as much as 20% of the weaponry it sent to the battlefield 
was damaged or destroyed. Now, that's not a good figure, but it's different than 20% of their whole stock. The startling rate of losses dropped to about 10% in the ensuing weeks. Some of the improvement came because Ukraine changed tactics, focusing more on wearing down Russian forces with artillery and long-range missiles than charging into enemy minefields and fire. Now, we're going to look at why charging into the enemy minefields, why this is such a complicated thing. We'll look at that in just a moment. And despite the losses that Ukrainians have so far taken, just five of the 60 miles they hope to cover to reach the Sea of the South and split Russian forces in two. If they can punch through, once they can punch through, then it's a very different game. But they haven't changed the game yet. Russia had many months to prepare for the counteroffensive, and its front line is littered with mines. Now let's stop there. So, unlike the counteroffensive that took place, that like lightning blitz uh, that took back Kharkiv and took back Kherson, and unlike those areas that took these big swaths of land, Russia's had now what, six, nine months to prepare, to put in entrenchments, to put in landmines, to put in all kinds of defensive emplacements in order to protect against what they knew would be coming down the line. So we're not going to see the same kind of massive land grab, at least not until they can punch through, that we saw before. Given those fortifications, experts say it's not surprising that Ukraine would sustain relatively severe losses in the early stages of the campaign. It's not as fast, but it's not catastrophically behind schedule, the British Defense Minister Ben Wallace said on Wednesday. Military experts have long said that the first 15 miles of the counteroffensive would be the hardest. Ukraine's top military officer expressed frustration that Ukraine is fighting without Western F-16 warplanes, which the United States only recently agreed to allow Ukrainian pilots to be trained on. So, with no air cover, they have to fight essentially an uphill battle. The odds are stacked against them because of the way that the Russians have had a chance to dig in and they have to oppose it. So uh, I'll show you visually what this means in just a moment. Nevertheless, he added, the absence of air superiority and air defenses that Western jets could provide for Ukraine's attack means that casualty rates are likely to be higher than in other conventional conflicts. Data from Oryx, a military analyst site that counts only the losses that it is visually confirmed, show that 28 of those Bradleys have been abandoned, damaged, or destroyed, including 15 in a village in Zaporizhia province on June 8th and 9th, as well as the 47th was attacked by helicopters while trapped in a minefield. So, Ukraine has a catch-22. They have to get moving. They have to advance. They have to have a counteroffensive to show the West, yes, see, we can do this. We're, we're working at it. Please keep supplying this so that we can do this. But they can't really do this as effectively as they could if they had all the weapons that they need to be able to prosecute the war properly. So they're in kind of a difficult place. Given that the 47th was the only brigade initially slated to receive the Bradleys, that means that nearly one-third of the original vehicles have been lost. The brigade lost 30% of the leopards it was given, and it faces another 55 miles to reach the Sea of Azov. Now, but again, the first 5, 10, 15 miles are going to be the roughest. After that, it'll be a lot smoother going. Okay, now, what's the problem? The problem is... The Russians know exactly where they're going to attack, or where where they could attack, and they've they've mapped out all these with uh, trench lines. They've mapped it out with artillery. They have it all figured out. Now, what we're going to do is look at what it looks like on the ground, and this comes from a YouTube channel named Invicta that does a great jo job laying out what you need to understand about what the trench lines are like. Now, I'm no military expert, but this help me understand and process what it is that they're up against. So let's look at this. Russia has built defenses along the length of the territory it occupies in Ukraine, as well as along a roughly 400 mile long strip of the Russo-Ukrainian border. But the most extensive defenses are on the nearly 250 mile front, anchored by the Dnieper River and the Russia-Ukraine border. Without natural obstacles like major rivers, Russian commanders have opted to shore up their lines using man-made obstacles and entrenchments. Although described as a line, Russian defenses in Ukraine are not an extended line of linked trenches, like something from the Western Front of World War I. Behind the actual front lines, Russian commanders have laid down defensive clusters that control towns, block key roads, and secure bridges. 
Russian defenses are also multi-layered. Some areas are defended by multiple defensive lines, and key roads are blocked by successive strongpoints. Ukrainian forces will therefore have to breach and break through multiple Russian lines as they push deeper into Russian-occupied territory. So if they are here Let's trying take a to break look. through, they're here trying to break through. This first five miles is going to be tricky. The first 10, 15 is going to be even harder as they triangulate on them and try to make sure that the, you know, uh, infl inflating fire, is that the right term? The artillery that's crossed over and can, can hit anything from any angle and the trench lines and all that. So let's just keep going. How these defenses have been laid out. For our purposes, we have chosen a section of the line about 18 kilometers east of Bakhmut, near the village of Viskirva, which has many of the features seen in Russian fortifications in the region. Like many Russian defenses in Ukraine, it controls a road Ukrainian forces might advance down. Now on a map like this, it can be somewhat deceptive to think that just a few dots indicate an area which is thinly defended. This is not the case. But to understand the reality of the situation on the ground, let us render the battlefield in its true size. This is what Russian defenses in Ukraine really look like. Our rendered battlefield is about 5 square kilometers or 3 square miles. In pre-war settings, someone can make the crossing by car in just about 3 minutes whilst following rural speed limits, while a bicyclist could make the crossing in about 15 minutes and a pedestrian could make the crossing in about 60 minutes. While at war, however, an attacker could take weeks, if not months, or even years to make the crossing with progress measured in mere meters. Yeah, and, and if you can't see why, you will see why in just a moment. It's, it's not as easy or quick going as you would think, and especially when you have to worry about the other forces coming behind you as you're trying to move through, as you're trying to But to understand obstacles. why, we can now explain how the Russians have fortified their position. Defenses in this sector are laid out with rows of obstacles blocking movement down roads and across fields towards dug-in fighting positions. The outer layer consists of various anti-tank features including hedgehogs, dragon's teeth, and large ditches. Interspersed between these are invisible minefields which together form a formidable thicket of obstacles for would-be attackers. In the outermost layer, you can see two bands of concrete dragon's teeth. These simple, anti-tank obstacles are laid out in long lines of two or more rows that can run for miles across open terrain. Like the partially buried Siegfried line teeth, the Russian obstacles have been placed on the surface, and their convenient lifting eyes can make it fairly easy for Ukrainian attackers to simply drag them out of the way. Yet so long as they are not displaced, vehicles will nonetheless still struggle to pass them. The next layer of anti-tank defenses are a series of ditches, which in this case are offset about 100 meters from the prior layers of manufactured traps. These holes in the ground are each about 3 to 4 meters wide and 1 to 2 meters deep. Primitive yet effective, they will prove sufficient to stop, or at least slow, tracked and wheeled vehicles. Now, if that's your goal, to stop or slow, I mean... That's pretty significant. Both the hedgehogs and the dragon's teeth and the ditches will stop, will slow. And if you have, you know, zeroed in on where those tanks are, stopping and slowing can be very, very deadly for them. In order to quickly dig these large ditches, the Russians have turned to specialized earth movers like the MDK-3. Given that the Russians have had months to prepare, it is no surprise that they have so widely adopted this simple, but effective form of defensive earthwork. Yet at this point, you might be thinking that these defenses seem annoying, but not necessarily deadly. Indeed, on their own, such obstacles could easily be neutralized by combat engineers and specialized vehicles. To prevent this, Russian forces have laid vast fields of mines in the open space around their obstacle belts, creating an unseen threat to attackers. For our simulation, we have only been able to represent a few possible locations. In reality, they could be just about anywhere. It is these invisible killers which are likely to take a heavy toll on Ukrainians who are not able to detect, avoid, or destroy them upon the advance. Sadly, the same can be said of all those who return to this battlefield long after the war has ended. But mine and anti-tank features alone will not be able to stop a determined offensive. As the military maxim goes, an obstacle isn't an obstacle unless it's defended. To this end, and to their credit, 
the Russians have generally tried to build an integrated defense, which places the obstacles we have reviewed at a logical distance from their manned frontline positions, which in this case is a series of infantry trenches and vehicle revetments. Regarding their placement, it seems that these have been located along a ridge line with high ground advantages over the fields ahead. The outermost anti-tank obstacles are about 500 meters ahead of the entrenched defensive positions. This puts them well within the effective range of light machine guns and RPGs. The last anti-tank ditch is about 300 meters away and is thus within range of assault rifles and 40 millimeter grenade launchers. Without proper support, Ukrainian dismounts trying to breach the obstacles could find themselves pinned down by withering fire. In this section of the line, Russian engineers have dug a company-sized position on a piece of high ground that commands the road. Most of the strong point is composed of simple trenches, deep enough for a man to stand in without being exposed. Some trenches have been dug by hand, but the rapid construction of these trenches is mostly owed to specialized digging machines like the BTM-3. Zooming back out of this position, we can see that our defenders here appear to be tasked with covering about 800 meters of the line. This can be a tall order for a Russian company to hold. After wartime reorganization, full-strength Russian motor rifle companies only have about 75 men, and few formations currently are at full strength. So let's just put that in perspective. 800 meters is about half a mile if you're speaking in an American context. So uh, they would need 150 men per mile. And then you can just do the quick math to see how many miles need to be covered to how many men need to, to cover that. But it's not just that. It's the minefield doing the heavy lifting. It's the dragon's teeth doing the heavy lifting. And then you're going to see artillery behind this that's going to be doing the work as well. This makes the firepower of supporting tanks and the company's own vehicles even more important. To this end, just as the strength of the infantry has been improved using trenches, such vehicles have also seen their effectiveness increased by the creation of revetments. These are holes dug into the ground, which allow vehicles to fire from hull down positions, presenting a much smaller target to Ukrainian attackers. Zooming back out once more, we can see how this Russian company does not stand alone. Besides it are several other positions which cover their flanks. To the rear are additional positions for HQ and reserve units. And atop a nearby hill are additional emplacements dating back to before the war, which have a commanding view of this battlefield. From here, spotting and fire support can be provided. Beyond this simulated area are even more layers of defenses with mechanized reserves backed by artillery, ready to pounce on any Ukrainians attempting to break through. I'll let all this soak in, as the scope of modern warfare can often be difficult to grasp in our minds. One thing he didn't even touch on, and I think this is important, is that the amount of vision that you have on the battlefield now with drones is astronomical. So let's say you're a tank trying to come through these lines. We have these dragon's teeth that you have to get through. Then you have mines. And while you're trying to negotiate these obstacles, before you get to a ditch, you are also spotted by drones hovering overhead. And you have to get go through carefully and slowly it's it's a very complicated thing. So the minefields are holding up the counteroffensive, but it's not just minefields, as you saw. Here's Ryan Macbeth talking about the same kind of thing. Ukrainian counterattack look like? Let's take a look at an unclassified example. Ukraine is going to have to deal with Russian trench lines. And while they may look similar to trenches from World War I, the big difference is ISR, or Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance, namely through small commercial drones, which weren't around in 1917. Drone, minefield, trenches, and Russian forces. The drones will find a weak breach point and most likely hit them with mortars. Units that are further back will get hit with long-range artillery. Units that are even further back, such as combat support units, will get hit with precision artillery. Breaching will be done by a Miklik, or mine clearing line charge. This shoots a rocket filled with explosives over the minefield, which explodes and detonates the mines. Infantry will then breach, most likely covered by drones. They will likely take heavy casualties, so they'll have to consolidate and reorganize. The engineering vehicle will likely plow over the first trench, allowing a follow-on force to continue the attack. Ukrainian forces can then evacuate wounded and prisoners of war. Do you want to know more? I have a whole article about it for free on my Substack below. Wow, that is a lot, 
right? And so, but that's the reality of what the Ukrainians have to face in the counteroffensive. Now, add on top of all the difficulties of getting through the counteroffensive, things like Ben Wallace is uh, about to resign. He's going to quit as the next uh, defense, like when they reshuffle the cabinet, he's he's standing down. He's getting out of government. And Ben Wallace has been such a staunch supporter. I mean, like second only to Boris um, in, in his fervent defense of Ukraine. So it's, I'm sure they'll put somebody in place that is going to be supporting Ukraine, but you don't know who that's going to be. Add to that that you have problems like in the United States with Tucker Carlson just beating the drums for Russia. Now, this this was really interesting. This happened la- at the end of last week, I think Friday or Saturday. Tucker Carlson asked Pence why he's more concerned with supplying Ukraine with tanks than the well-being of American cities. And this is covered here by Jackson Hinkle. I'm going to show you a, a little bit better one. This is the exact same clip but it's a little bit longer here in Stephen Gardner, and he's talking about it here. You get to see the video. When you watch the clip, I want you to watch Pence's body language as Tucker's talking to him. Like, Pence really can't stand Tucker and the way that he's uh, approaching this. Plus, Vice President Mike Pence ends his political career in just one comment. Roll the clip. Along the way, the Biden administration has been slow in providing military support. Make no mistake about this. We promised them 33 Abrams tanks in January. I heard again two weeks ago in Ukraine, they still don't have them. We've been telling them we'll train their F-16 pilots, but now they're saying maybe January we'll let somebody transfer some jets. I'm sorry, Mr. Vice President, have you, I know you're running for president. Okay, so before Tucker talks, look at what Pence was saying, look, we need to do more. Like, that's his position. Okay? Here's Tucker. And watch Pence's body language as uh, Tucker talks. You are are distressed that the Ukrainians don't have enough American tanks. Yeah. Every city in the United States has become much worse over the past three years. Drive around. There's not one city that's gotten better in the United States. And it's visible. Our economy has degraded. The suicide rate has jumped. Public filth and disorder and crime have exponentially increased. And yet your concern. Okay, so what Tucker is saying, there there is some truth to the problems that we're having here, but that doesn't mean that there is not a, a real issue here in foreign policy just because we have issues domestically. And uh, Pence is not really happy to be here with Tucker, as you can see. There is a, a, a big rift within the Republican Party here, and Tucker is the Trumpian wing of this, and Pence is the conservative wing, or one of the people on, demonstrating or holding up the conservative wing of the party. Then you have this. This is the most discouraging thing that I've seen so far, and that is that I don't believe that Putin has any designs to give up anytime soon. I think we'll be talking about where we are in the war in Ukraine this time next year, and I hate to say that. Please, I hope I'm wrong. I want to be wrong about this. But this is what Putin is doing in the schools. Readiness for service. Russia's schools are continuing marching toward militarization. So, Here, this was just covered just last week. State Duma Deputy Andrei Katapolov lamented what he said was the unpreparedness of young volunteers and conscripts joining the Russian military. So a solution? Start teaching them a high school military skills. They are infantile youths who, in many respects, are not prepared for real life. So the remedy is, over the next two years, Russian schools will address the purported issue by scrapping its long-standing program called Fundamentals of Safe Living and replacing it with a block of lectures with working with the title of Fundamentals of Safety and Defense of the Homeland. So they're starting to groom sophomores, juniors, and seniors those last three years of high school for military service. It is the latest intensification of the threat of patriotic education. Students in 10th grade will be taught the elements of basic military preparedness. In addition to drills and instruction in basic military skills, it will also include lectures on the career prospects of military service. 
In 11th grade, such lessons will continue with the formation of Russian civic identity, patriotism, and a sense of responsibility towards one home, one's homeland, as well as the development of the conviction and readiness for the service and defense of the fatherland. Other lecture topics to be covered include the danger of being lured into illegal and antisocial activity and the use of young people as a tool for destabilization. Students will also be warned about what the documents call the danger of fakes as an element of information warfare. Instructors will tell students that it is illegal to violate norms about the distribution of information about the role of the USSR during World War II or to commit public acts aimed at discrediting the armed forces of the Russian Federation. Gotta call it a special military operation. In the wake of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, the government hastily adopted a series of laws criminalizing the knowing distribution of, quote, false information, unquote, about Russian military operations and discrediting the Russian armed forces. The new block of lectures replaces a Soviet-era innovation called Fundamentals of Safe Living. Over the years, the course of weekly lectures, 68 hours per academic year, was modified to include sections on emerging threats such as terrorism and cybercrime. The current version includes lectures on reducing the risk of terrorist attacks, ways of remaining safe in large crowds, and fundamentals of online safety. The new course will also include basic first aid, but other topics will be replaced by basic military preparedness, including, get this, the maintenance and operation of Kalashnikov automatic rifle and two types of hand grenades. This is going to be taught in high school in Russian schools. What does that tell you? It tells me that Russia has no plans to stop anytime soon. The program is similar to the basic military training taught in schools during the Soviet period that was canceled in 1993. Kratostov said that the new courses could be taught by veterans of this special military operation. Since 2014, the Education Ministry has recommended that schools organize five-day military camps for all 10th grade boys and girls on a voluntary basis to be held, uh, if possible, at nearby military base. The purpose of the camp is to form the moral, psychological, and physical qualities necessary for service in the armed forces. Students learn how to dig trenches, march in formation, shoot, throw grenades, move around a battlefield, and cope with battlefield injuries. Children at the lower levels get lessons on Russia's natural wonders, interspersed with patriotic messages such as, love your motherland, and hear this, it's not scary to die for the motherland. So Russia has no plans of going anywhere. Uh, they're, they're in it for the long haul. So that's the bad news. The bad news is the, the battlefield reality. The bad news is Ben Wallace may be replaced or the, the infighting within the United States that could potentially be disruptive or whatever else. But the bad news is also that Russia has no ambitions to stop this war anytime soon. Okay, I'm sorry. I hope I didn't bum you out. Go get an aspirin. Um, and I you know, but I, I need to make sure that I'm telling you the, the whole truth, even though I'm fully in for Ukraine, I don't want to be a propagandist. I, I'm going to show you the things that you need to see uh, as much as I don't even want to talk about it myself. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you for the likes, the subscribes, and the shares, and the coffees. And thank you most of all for caring about Ukraine.